everyone, and welcome to International Peace and Conflict Studies. This module, we're going to talk about the rise of so-called new conflicts in the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Uh, and these are conflicts that were discussed a little bit in the introductory readings from Contemporary Conflict Resolution. Now, these conflicts aren't new so much in the fact that they've long existed, but they have come to dominate the security scene, and many might argue have come to replace interstate war as the primary source of international conflict in the modern era. So in Module 5, we are going to be talking about these new conflicts with a specific focus on ethnic and nationalist violence. So to begin, we'll talk about the rise of modern interstate conflict. As we mentioned, a form of conflict that has come to challenge interstate conflict as one of the primary security threats. We'll spend a bit of time talking about uh, the roots of ethnic and national identity, something that seems to underlie a lot of these, these conflicts we'll be discussing. And third, talk about ethnic and nationalist conflicts themselves, some of the main motivators and drivers of these types of conflicts. And finally, talk about ethno-nationalist violence itself, and mass atrocity with a focus on the Rwandan genocide. So first, the rise of interstate conflict. This is something that's come to dominate the security scene, particularly following the end of the Cold War. And interstate conflict, uh, again, as something different from what we were talking about during our, our module on interstate war, are conflicts that occur within the state. Uh, so they are unique for the fact that they operate within the boundaries of a single state as opposed to between state actors. And these are conflicts that can be fought between two state government groups, a non-state group versus a state, or even two non-state groups warring against each other. But as we'll talk about, one of the unique characteristics of these types of interstate conflicts, uh, and particularly the new interstate conflicts that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century, is the fact that they do tend to have a strong underlying component of group identity motivating them, whether they're political, ethnic, or national. Indeed, the decade of the 1990s and on into the 21st century has been characterized by a number of interstate conflicts tied to things like ethnicity and nationalism, including conflicts in Rwanda, the former Yugoslavia, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Indonesia, Northern Ireland, and many, many more. And these are very immediate conflicts because they tend to pit neighbor versus neighbor, sometimes family versus family or village versus village. So they can be incredibly divisive and destructive. They don't occur in some kind of far off place, but right in the homes and they affect the societies uh, in which they occur. And as a result, these can be particularly brutal for civilian populations, as they're often involved directly in these conflicts, both as combatants and even more frequently as the main targets or victims, either being the direct victims of violence, uh, those that are killed or wounded, but most often those that are displaced and become refugee populations. And the destruction of interstate conflict, even though it occurs within the borders of the state, it's often not just limited to that single state. They often have a strong spillover component where these conflicts can bleed over into other states and cause uh, havoc and maybe even conflict in, there, in, in those uh, adjoining regions as transborder refugee flows or even as a sort of uh, other interstate violence. So while we might have seen a decline in interstate wars, and this has been a major positive trend in the latter half of the 20th century, Instead, we've seen this rise of these new conflicts of interstate wars, which have quickly become one of the main threats to international security. So what is an ethnic group, or what do we mean when we talk about ethnic identity? It's a very slippery concept in some ways, and there's a lot of different interpretations about this. But for our purposes, it's a group that shares some kind of distinct group name and identity. Uh, boundaries which separate us from them or self from other, and which link people together. And it's often distinguished by very clear markers of who belongs to which ethnic group. And these are the kind of things that people use to identify themselves and which others use to identify them. So things like uh, skin color, uh, potentially race, clothing, style of dress, language, all of these certain things might serve as clear markers of group identity. But ethnic groups also uh, are distinguished by sharing a sense of of shared kinship or familiar attachment, even if it's quite obscure or different. So there is some kind of shared belief in common ancestry of, of some sort. So common descent, a common history, or some, some attachment to common memories as well. And along with this, there is some sense of shared culture, uh, whether that's language, religion, values, beliefs, uh, traditions, or otherwise. And finally, last but not least, Ethnic groups almost always have some kind of shared ancestral attachment to a particular territory as well, even if it's one that that group's not currently occupying. 
some kind of uh, territorial homeland of the people which can still bring a very strong attachment which they call their own. Now national identity is slightly different and when we refer to uh, a national identity or nation we're talking about a group that feels some kind of shared sense of identity bonding them together but who also seeks some form of political self-determination. And this is often uh, tied around some kind of shared language or culture, but in the modern state system does have that political element where there's a group of people that want control over the government or territory, and they want that territory to represent them as a people. So nationalism, very something very much tied to this national identity, which is the belief that one's own national group should be politically autonomous and have control over the government or territory of the region which they're in, in the form of a nation state. Very much something that's tied to this principle of self-determination which was developed during the 20th century post-World War II and which is now a key principle underlying uh, both the United Nations and the international community more broadly. And it's that idea that groups with distinct national identities should have the right to form a state and exercise sovereignty or control over their own affairs. And very much tied to the idea that the natural organization of international politics should be the nation state as opposed to things like broader states or empires. And there definitely is a link here with ethnic identity. Indeed, it's these kinds of appeals to ethnic identity that most often form the basis for national identity or nationalist movements for self-determination. But again, the important distinction here between ethnic Id identity and nationalist identity is that ethnic groups don't always have the political aim to be recognized as nations. Some of the examples here are places like U.S. and Canada, Largely immigrant nations made up of a slew of different ethnic groups, but for the most part they're bound together under a common national identity of being Canadian or American. So not all ethnic groups desire to be nations, and not all nations tend to be formed by ethnic groups. Though, that said, history has shown that where members of an ethnic group do live together as the majority population, the chances do increase that they may come to view themselves as a nation and begin pushing towards this kind of self-determination. So identity, really, really important. But it's important to note that oftentimes ethnic or national identity are incredibly powerful things, and this sense of uh, shared kinship or belonging can be an incredibly powerful thing. Oftentimes they are, at least in part, socially constructed. So whether there's this idea that ethnicity or national binds people together, oftentimes at least part of it is a fabrication. But that doesn't really matter. Um, it does seem that Ethnic and national identity plays a really important role, almost a natural drive, fulfilling a natural drive that people have for this sense of shared bonding and belonging among individuals. And it does seem to be a key thing that helps to divide the world into us and them or self versus other. There's a lot of really interesting social psychological research that talks about this kind of innate drive that seems to be prom uh, prominent in almost all humans around the world. And this seems to be a key way that we make sense of the world around us in a key way that we get a sense of belonging. And indeed, there is a large body of social psychological research that suggests why it is that hostilities and violence often seems to occur between these kind of ethnic or national identities. And these studies suggest that there is an inherent tendency towards what they call ethnocentrism among ethnic and national groups, which is a psychological tendency to see one owns group and group members in favorable terms while viewing those outside in slightly less favorable or maybe even negative terms. Very much based on this kind of identity principle of dividing in-group versus out-group or self versus other. And so this potential for ethnocentrism can become even more powerful when other group is made, is made clear by clear indicators of difference between us and them. So things like looks, uh, whether somebody speaks a different language or worships a different religion can all become factors which clearly help to distinguish self from other. But the important thing to note is that though uh, social psychology suggests that this kind of ethnocentrism might be an inborn quality, it doesn't necessarily mean that conflicts predetermine between ethnic and nationalist groups. So this biological drive for belonging uh, might help to organize people into groups, but it doesn't necessarily suggest that they're going to get into conflict with one another. Instead, what seems to uh, what we seem to need is lots of other contextual and historical factors. So why do we see nationalist conflict then? And first, we should say uh, nationalist conflict is defined as a civil war fought by one or more national groups. And what we find is that nationalism and national identity can sometimes be a potential source of conflict when the borders of a state 
the political borders of a state don't align with those of national identities living within it, or particularly if they're national groups living within a state that don't feel they're getting fair representation under the current government. So what we see is nationalism and national identity can be a source of conflict sometimes uh, when uh, national identities fight for control of the government, or instead when national identities fight to create an entirely new state based around uh, their own national identity. And so usually this takes the form of a push for things like secession by a province or a region of a state uh, away from an already existing country. And usually with that seceding territory based around a unified national identity. Uh, and so essentially a new uh, territory sought to be created with new international borders. But this can be a really tough undertaking and very often will quickly lead to violence. And why is this the case? Because often the state that that group is trying to secede from doesn't want to give up control over the territory that it has. And also it can be really difficult because other established states are very leery of recognizing the rights of new states to secede because they fear that this might lead to their own internal breakups within their own countries. So this can be quite dangerous. And we see nationalist conflicts like this happen often. Uh, some of the cases we've already looked at, places like Northern Ireland, Israel-Palestine, or, or even more recently Kosovo after the breakup of Yugoslavia. So it's not too surprising that oftentimes we see nationalist conflict uh, strongly linked to colonial legacies. And this is because uh, where we see the vast majority of these nationalist conflicts take place are in former colonies where there's emerging national identities that are struggling to gain independence from their former colonial rulers. And this is very strongly linked to the legacy of imperialism, which is when European empires had gone out around the world, conquered territories, and often drawn the boundaries of their colonial holdings with very little input from local populations, which means that the boundaries often didn't extend to national groups within these states, um, and they didn't really give those national groups much in the way of real representation. The end result of this is when empires left or when we saw independence movements emerge, it often meant that there was a mismatch between the former state borders, uh, the former state political borders created by empires, and the national identities living within them. And so this meant that oftentimes in these post-colonial contexts, we saw very strong drives for self-determination play out again and again and again, and leading to many nationalist conflicts, often centered in post-colonial states in places like Africa and Asia, where the majority of former colonies uh, were located. So oftentimes we did see conflicts here uh, where national identities were fighting for self-determination and independence in some of these post-colonial regions. But one of the other areas where we saw a lot of nationalist conflicts emerge, uh, particularly post-Cold War and post-World War II, is in countries that have dissolved or fragmented. And this refers to situations where there's formerly large multinational states that collapse, either from internal or external uh, pressure, and break into new, smaller pieces. What this means is that borders that were once internal in some of these bigger countries, such as regions or provinces, quickly become international boundaries of new states. And the danger here, and why this has such a high propensity for nationalist violence, is that the territory where those lines, those new lines on the map are going to be drawn are often heavily disputed as to who should claim what territory. And where to draw these lines is often very, very blurry and up for, up for debate. And sometimes we might even see collapsing states themselves turn to violence to try to hold on to the former territories that it's going to lose. So the fragmentation or dissolution of larger multinational states can certainly lead to nationalist violence. And we saw this sometimes in some of the prime examples might be the breakup of the USSR in 1989 and all the conflict that flowed out of that. And things like the breakup of the former multinational state of Yugoslavia in the early 1990s when several regions declared their independence as separate states. And in the case of Yugoslavia in particular, this was very violent and led to a brutal period known as the Yugoslav Wars in the early 1990s, driven in large part by Serbian invasions to seize control of areas of both Bosnia and Croatia that contains Serbian populations, so to unite that national identity. But it's important to note, again, this doesn't always lead to violence. We do have other examples where a former multinational state fragmented or dissolved, and we saw uh, new states formed without violence. And one of the best examples is the former state of Czechoslovakia, which left the USSR relatively peacefully when it collapsed in 1989, in what uh, later became known as the so-called Velvet or Gentle Revolution, 
which split into uh, what we now know as the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, by 1993 in a very peaceful and cooperative manner. Ethnic conflict, on the other hand, is slightly different than nationalist conflict, and it's become one of the most prevalent types of interstate conflict we've witnessed since the end of the Cold War. It's now considered to be one of the biggest current threats to international security. So when we talk about ethnic conflict, instead of uh, internal wars between nations or national identity, what we're talking about is conflict that breaks out between two or more ethnic groups. So again, groups of people who may share some kind of a uh, sense of shared ancestry, uh, racial ties, linguistic, religious, or cultural ties with one another as well. And most importantly, they see themselves as bound together by a shared sense of group identity where individuals see themselves as being part of this larger ethnic group. Again, however, having two ethnic groups living together within a state does not necessarily mean that we're going to see this type of ethnic conflict, though research has suggested that it can, in some cases, make conflict more likely. And, and some of the contextual factors that might make conflict more likely is if there has been a past history of antagonistic social relationships or beliefs between two uh, ethnic groups that might create negative attitudes or hostility. But more often than not, what we found is that what we need to really tip these things off into the conflict is often the involvement of intentional strategies by ethnic elites or leaders who try to use ethnic identity as, as a source that they can manipulate and mobilize to channel feelings of hatred or hostility to solidify their own positions of political power within their own community, oftentimes very much so for their own gain. And somebody like Slob Slobodan Milosevic in the former Yugoslavia is an excellent example of this, somebody that tried to rally people around things like Serb ethnicity and Serb nationalism uh, during the Yugoslav Wars, very much for his own political gain, to kind of prop himself up within the, for, uh, within the former Yugoslavia. So oftentimes we see these leaders, leaders doing things like exaggerating differences or the danger from other ethnic groups to consolidate their positions or popularity within their own groups, uh, and even sometimes coming to form extreme ethnically based political parties defined at least in opposition to other ethnic groups. But aside from leaders and aside from past histories of conflicts, there is evidence uh, to also suggest that ethnic identity only really becomes uh, very dangerous when these divisions along ethnic lines become associated with tangible grievances amongst groups living within one state. For instance, if ethnic identity becomes tied to patterns of long-standing domination or exploitation of one group over another based on these kinds of ethnic identities, and this is often the case where we see uh, majority or minority domination, where access to political, social, or economic goods becomes largely determined by one's own ethnic group. And this can become particularly dangerous when one ethnic group gains control of the state and is able to use the state's powers to improve their own position at the expense of another. So a very strong motivator for conflict can be this kind of fear of ethnic extinction or domination within a state, uh, which can definitely increase hostility across a group lines. And we see lots of uh, examples of where we see these patterns of domination and discrimination leading to ethnic conflict or ethnic violence. Uh, one example is South Africa during apartheid, um, which you see kind of in the bottom two pictures, uh, bottom two left-hand pictures on, on the slide. Uh, this is uh, apartheid was a regime very much tied to racial and ethnic identity where the white minority ruled over all other groups in that society, in particular the black majority, for their own benefit, eventually leading to very violent anti-apartheid struggles. Or uh, a case study that we've talked about a few times already, Northern Ireland, is uh, a conflict not just over national identity, but one also tied to a long history of social exclusion, political marginalization, and economic qualities, uh, inequalities where we saw the Protestant Unionist minority dominating uh, the government in Northern Ireland. However, whatever the initial causes or origins of ethno-national violence, once violence or patterns of repression does begin between two ethnic or national groups, it can become very, very dangerous very quickly. And part of the reason is, is because ethno-national violence does tend to become self-reinforcing and further increase uh, the divides that created it. And there's, again, there's been a lot of work by social psychologists and conflict theorists on this that show how violence between two ethnic or nationalist groups can become self-reinforcing. And some of these focus around the fact that uh, 
Uh, the perception of threat from an outgroup can further solidify cohesion of an in-group and reinforce already existing ethnic divisions. And a lot of this is just common sense. It kind of makes sense that if two groups come into conflict with one another, they might band together versus a perceived threat or attack from the other. We also see ethno-national violence being very dangerous and self-reinforcing because it does serve to break down existing, uh, more positive existing relationships and contact between groups and increase things like physical separation and segregation between enemies, uh, driving people away from those that they're in conflict, conflict with. We also see psychological patterns of separation and segregation spring up over, over the course of conflict, where we see the growth in things like stereotypes, or where group members often see each other in very negative lights, or develop very strong and negative prejudices about the other uh, ethnic group. And it tends to see each other not just as individual human beings anymore, but purely as representatives of the other group, and often, again, in a very, very negative way. Uh, so we see patterns of depersonalization or de-individualization uh, start to spring up between different groups. So if you take this together, um, this fact that people tend to withdraw against perceived threats, uh, break down into physical separation and segregation, develop things like stereotype and prejudice, all these things together can help to ensure the creation of reciprocal cycles of violence between ethnic and nationalist groups, where we could see back and forth tit for tat attacks that only serve to further reinforce group divisions and create a sense of victimization that virtually ensures that future violence is going to continue. And so often in ethnic and nationalist violence, we see patterns of violence that are both protracted, which means that they're very, very long in duration, and also intractable, which means that they're notoriously difficult to bring to some kind of peaceful resolution. And the result of this can be the creation of very deeply divided societies, where those societies essentially become fractured into ethnic or national identities uh, that are in, in conflict with one another. Take it to its furthest extreme, we can see ethno-national violence between uh, ethnic or nationalist groups become marked by patterns of dehumanization. And this is essentially psychological separation, uh, again, taken to the nth degree, where one group might no longer come to see the other as human beings, and often using things like viral or animal metaphors to describe members of the enemy group. So referring to them as things like cockroaches, vermin, viruses, or etc. And what you see in the bottom right-hand corner is an example of Nazi propaganda around the time of the Holocaust, basically uh, portraying uh, Jews as a spider that was going to take over the entire world and something that you had to react very strongly against and potentially try to exterminate. So of course this can be very, very, very dangerous because it effectively removes moral safeguards against violence. If you no longer see that other group as fully human, they're no longer entitled to the same protections of basic human rights we'd normally extend to somebody else. And so this creates a profoundly skewed moral equilibrium or a mortal moral order in society that's all out of whack, where we recognize that there might be certain prote protections for ourselves, but not for members of this other group. And in the worst instance, it might even become viewed as legitimate or even right to carry out acts of horrific violence against the other. And this is where we start to get patterns of things emerge like mass, so-called mass atrocities. Uh, so where we see inter-ethnic atrocities occur on a mass scale. One example of this would be ethnic cleansing, something very much characterizing the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s. And the UN definition of ethnic cleansing is the planned and deliberate removal from a specific territory, persons of a particular ethnic group to render that area ethnically homogeneous. And lots of ways that you can do this, but usually through violent means, through carrying out things like murder, rape, or forced displacement of members of one ethnic group to get them off the territory uh, so you can take it over and render that area ethnically homogeneous. We also, and even slightly more heinously, have crimes of genocide which refers to the systematic extermination of another ethnic or religious group in whole or in part, or also nationalist groups as well. And so not just ethnic cleansing, not just removing people from territory, but trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. And uh, one example of this, the one that probably everybody's most familiar with, is of course the Nazi Holocaust of the Jews, Roma, homosexuals, and other groups declared uh, so-called undesirables uh, by the Germans. And so the drive uh, by the Nazis was to essentially ex systematically exterminate all these other groups. 
uh, leading to the deaths of over 6 million Jews uh, and others considered to be unpure uh, during the Holocaust. One example of this, and this forms the case study for our module this week, um, is the Rwandan genocide of 1994. And we won't go into great detail here, as if you've got the excellent Ghosts of Rwanda documentary that'll help you to fill in some of the background. But the Rwandan genocide, an excellent example of this ethno-nationalist violence taken to, taken to its extreme and resulting in a mass atrocity. Where in the span of just 100 days between April and July 1994, we saw between 800,000 to a million Rwandans killed in an act of genocide. The vast majority of these being Tutsi who were targeted by uh, the Hutu majority. And women in particular became targets for violence, uh, resulting in, in acts of mass rape as well as killing as part of the genocide. And this was a genocide that was extremely well planned and well organized. Not a random outbreak of violence, but had organizers and leaders at top political and military levels helping to carry it out, including local mayors and members of the police as well as senior members of the military. So very much originally led by elites, uh, including an unofficial mi military group of Hutu extremist youth known as the Interkomwe, estimated at about 30,000 people, who had received arms and training from the Rwandan army. But what sets the Rwandan genocide apart is that very soon after, it started to include the involvement of broad citizenry of the Hutu population in Rwanda. And many of these people got involved in killing themselves, often killing of their, their neighbors, other members of their villages, sometimes encouraged by soldiers and police, or in some cases forced into murder of their neighbors at the risk of their own lives, or sometimes we saw people killing others for their own personal gain as well. Uh, Rwandan genocide also very distinguished for the fact of how big of a role media and propaganda played in the carrying out of the genocide, played a huge role in this case, both in form of local print media and on the radio particularly, where we saw radio programs dehumanizing Tutsi and directly promoting their killings, spreading myths about Tutsi treachery, spreading terror about what would happen if the Tutsis came into power in Rwanda, and referring to them things as, as things like cockroaches and tall grass that needed to be cut down. So very dehumanizing language used here. And it's important to note that all this, all the killing that went on during the Rwandan genocide happened against the backdrop of a real failure of the international community to step in and intervene. Uh, as you'll see in the Ghosts of Rwanda, Canadian General Romeo Dallaire was in the country with a couple of thousand UN peacekeepers, but those keep peacekeepers were grossly underfunded, under-resourced, under, understaffed, and very importantly, didn't have a mandate uh, by the UN to actually get involved in stopping the genocide from happening. And many, many UN member states, particularly the US, refused to refer to what was occurring in Rwanda as a genocide as this would have legally triggered states to have an obligation to get involved to stop it from happening. And the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide was very devastating, not just for the 800,000 to the million Rwandans that were killed, but also for the vast displacement of estimated nearly 2 million Hutus who fled Rwanda uh, for fear of reprisal. So it created a major refugee crisis, not just for Rwanda, but for all the surrounding countries around it. And it also left a society that was very deeply divided where the violence that occurred virtually destroyed local community and social relations. And this has created major problems in Rwanda for reintegration and reconciliation down the road. Problems that Rwanda is still very much struggling with on the 20th anniversary this year of the Rwandan genocide. Okay, that's it for the online lecture component of this module. Uh, now that you've finished this up, just go ahead and you can screen the Ghosts of Rwanda documentary that's been posted up online. Uh, after that, you can go ahead and complete the required readings, and just as a reminder for this module, we've got the readings from Lake and Rothschild, uh, the readings from Kaufman, and the readings from Staub and Bartol. And if you can, do review that quick section on Azar from the course text as well, as noted in the required readings. Once that's finished up, you can head online and uh, post throughout the course of the module. Uh, you hear your thoughts in response to some of our discussions or in response to some of your classmates. And last but not least, if you are signed up for a response paper this week, just remember that is due this Sunday online uh, via Wild Courses by 11.59 p.m.